I have a new title as well. Um, Theory from Mormonism, Gold Plates, Mormon Materiality and the Trouble with Taking Religion Seriously. Um, so last year, I published an article. It argued that Joseph Smith encountered real plates. These plates, I said, were not ancient Nephite relics, but were printing plates, commonly used for industrial printing in the antebellum United States. Um, these could have been either copper plates, which look like this, or stereotype plates, which look like this. Um, stereotype plates are just when somebody takes a bunch of, sorry, <laughs> movable types, um, which you know were used in printing since the days of Gutenberg, and then casts them together in a solid metal plate. Um, and that's what you get here. And it became the most popular form of bookmaking in the, in the 19th century US. Um, like the artifacts that were described in the witness accounts, these plates approximated the dimensions of the pages of a book. They were used to print books, so um, you know exactly the, the page dimensions. They read from right to left, so you can see that even a little bit better here. Um, this is a stereotype leaf and its corresponding plate for a stereotype book. Um, and as you can see, the impression, the page over here goes from left to right. You know, it's just, it's regular right reading like in English. But the plate reads in the manner of languages like Hebrew, you know, from, from right to left. And they were quite heavy when collected together in a set, which is typically how they were stored. Um, this is a typical box used for storing stereotype plates. Um, stereotype plates really don't exist much anymore because they were often um, uh, melted down for scrap. Um, but some have uh, endured at the library company in their, in their basement. Um, so they found this old box of stereotype plates for me that I could photograph. I also suggested a number of scenarios in which Smith could have encountered printing plates, seeding his notion of gold plates. For instance, he could have seen them in a printing shop in Canandaigua. Um, Canandaigua is marked by the red arrow here below. It's about seven uh, miles south of Smith's farm, which is the, um, the little um, yellow circle. Um, there, there was a printer named James Bemis who was printing from stereotype plates as early as 1823 and was printing from copper plates earlier than that. My argument in the article was that instead of approaching the plates as only the product of Smith's vivid imagination or as a kind of concrescence of metaphysical and magical culture that surrounded him um, that was common in the antebellum period, especially in upstate New York, Smith's physical encounter with printing plates mattered. It sparked his imagination, it changed his course, and it eventually crystallized into the Book of Mormon. So there it is. And I'm just gonna talk over this slide for a little while. Um, I wanna use my time today to reflect on that plates project and discuss some of the theoretical and epistemological roads I went down and some of the roadblocks I encountered when I was down on them. As I explored the notions of real plates, the generativity of physical encounters with material objects and Smith's own sense of surprise and wonder in engaging the material world, I found myself to my own surprise and wonder increasingly taking my cues from the Mormon tradition. So with that in mind, I wanna make two points in this paper. One, I wanna discuss, for lack of a less pretentious phrase, I'm sorry, the tacit metaphysics of religious studies. This is a metaphysics that presumes ways in which the world works, how historical change occurs, what a human is, and how humans relate to non-human things. Investments along these lines have made some scholarly questions off limits and have thus made it difficult to even consider the possibility that Smith encountered real plates. Two, I wanna explore how the Mormon tradition offers intellectual resources that might challenge that metaphysics and embolden different sorts of questions that otherwise would have been off limits or inadmissible. What I'm after here is how Mormonism provides not only data for the scholar of religious studies, but theory as well. Ultimately, I argue that theory from a religious tradition, call it emic theory, indigenous theory, we could call it a lot of different things, has the power to unsettle the world of the scholar and her tacit presumptions about how the world works. So part one, religious studies has a metaphysics. Um, I begin with reviewer B. <laughs> 
The plates, paper, sod, square share of critique, um, most of it was very fair, very welcome, very useful. Um, there's one critique that I received repeatedly that I think is worth pausing on. Several reviewers said essentially this. Historians of religion, at least the good ones, do not ask positivistic questions about religion. They deal with reports of angels, but they do not inquire about the span of an angel's wings. You know, they'll study the meanings and popular uses of Ouija boards, but stop short of actually asking like, oh, well, like who, who, what, what dead ancestor were they actually channeling? Um, you know, they'll analyze the burning bush, but not ask like, oh, how long did it burn for? Like at what temperature did it burn for? Um, their point is that in asking about real plates, I was doing it wrong. I was engaging in something that looked either like, and I got both of these critiques, it either looked like vulgar, vulgar debunking, you know, of the worst sort on the one hand, or like Mormon apologetics on the other. Um, different reviewers of the paper called it both debunking and apologetic. I mentioned this specific objection because it distills a key MO in religious studies, namely that studying religion means studying culture and imagination. You know, it means studying how people practice and make meaning and how they do this on their own terms. You know, and we're not supposed to subject our subjects' claims on reality to critical inquiry. Um, sometimes people describe this as taking religion seriously. Various scholars have theorized this MO, this idea, in sophisticated ways in religion and cognate fields. So Robert Orsi famously urged scholars of religion to pursue a state of suspension. That's his word with their subjects. Suspension means drawing near, but without judgment. Respecting that religions have a different way of seeing the world and that we, the scholars, can never really fully understand them. As a scholarly self-discipline, suspension is especially important to maintain when religions get rather weird or outlandish. Um, he developed his ideas around the example of Appalachian snake handling. From the discipline of anthropology, Eduardo Baveros de Castro has articulated a view on religious realities um, that is similar over a career that, um, over a career investigating what he calls indigenous conceptual worlds in the Americas, he argued that there are, in his words, multiple ontologies. These multiple ontologies have different ontological rules about how reality functions. For instance, in Madagascar, a dance can make it rain. Some of these ontologies must be understood in terms of their, and this is his phrase again, radical alterity to the scholar's world. So here the terminology is different, but the move, you know, that scholarly maneuver is quite similar to Orsi's. Um, you know, to take religion seriously and empathetically by taking it on its own terms, you need to do a bit of respectful bracketing it off. This sort of approach is not unknown to Mormon studies either. Um, I think of Michael Quinn's magisterial, excellent early Mormonism in the magic worldview, um, which has always caught me up on that word worldview. The work of this, world, of this word is the work of suspension and radical alterity. You know, slow down, don't judge. This group of early Mormons had an internally coherent um, and different understanding of how the world works, though it may be different from yours and from mine. All of the above concepts have done really important work. They've enabled scholars to deal with religions respectfully and understand them on their own terms. These are um, techniques that I continue to use. Um, these are some of the first things I say to my own undergraduates in my you know, freshman American religious history seminar. You, know, um, you need to like, not judge, you need to slow down, you need to understand religions on their own terms. It's gonna look different. The past is a different country, et cetera. Okay, so while I say all of that, I do have a couple lingering questions about that. For one thing, did early saints really live in an utterly different world? In upstate New York in 1823, Joseph Smith believed he had a visionary dream of an angelic visitation. Okay, he also believed that he lived in a house, he loved his family, he got hungry, he went for walks. To risk stating the obvious, Smith and I share a lot. Um, I, do I do those things too. <laughs> How can scholars distinguish what belongs to his magic worldview his radically different ontology, and what is belonging to shared reality. Um, I'm not sure that conceptually we can really defend separating those things cleanly. For another thing, what is lost when we bracket religions, approaching them as sites of difference? At what cost do we do this? 
The answer to this begins with observing that the armor that we put on Ouija boards, burning bushes, rain dances, gold plates, and so on to protect them, equally is an armor that holds observers back. Suspension implies separation. Orsi urges me to suspend myself before the world of Joseph Smith, but always with the first assumption that his world is not mine, that he lived in a phenomenal world that looked little like my own. I'm gonna put my point in its strongest form at the risk of lacking nuance. When we bracket religions such as Mormonism, when we respect them and take them seriously, but by assuming they belong to an utterly different world with special rules, we can't learn from them. We can only learn about them. They have no power over the scholar because they have been made data. You know, we've declawed them, defanged them. Bracketing not only protects the religious subject from the threat of vulgar debunkers, it is doubly protective. It also protects the scholar from risking any reassessment of her own common sense notions. But what if Mormonism is not wholly other? What if Smith and his circle did not belong to another world entirely? What new possibilities does that then open up? What kinds of questions can I ask if I assume that Joseph Smith and I live in the same reality um, the same world with one single ontology. And I think that Mormonism and Mormon studies in particular are well positioned to address that question. So part two, Mormon theory. When I started asking questions about the plates, something strange happened, something definitely not encouraged by my training. I began to learn a great deal from Mormonism as well as about it. So on this, I have three points in particular. Number one, to begin, I quickly realized that believing scholars were pretty much my only, or if not my only, my strongest allies in interpreting the witness testimonies in similar ways that I did, which was by taking them at their word that there were real plates and not along with the religious studies consensus, which was attributing them to an elaborate vision, which only made sense within a different world with different rules. Rather than pointing to an existence of a magical worldview or a radically different ontology, Terrell Gibbons and Richard Bushman read the witness testimonies and said, well, um, sounds like a real thing we got here. You know, a real thing like this, like water bottle is a real thing. Um, nothing extravagant or bombastic was alleged, but here's just something real that, you know, I can hold in my hands. Gibbons argues that the abundance of witness testimonies ought to guide interpreters away from quoting him, the realm of Smith's interiority and subjectivity, you know, guiding people away from the idea that plates were only in his religious vision alone, and quote, toward that of empiricism and objectivity, unquote. Bushman uses a psychoanalytic word to describe the actions of religious studies scholars. They repress the witness accounts. Uh, that's a strong psychoanalytic word. He goes on, quote, skeptics have to minimize quotations from the participants or else the plates take on all too real a life, unquote. Um, so that's number one, that um, more, believing Mormon scholars seem to offer these kind of this early set of allies. Number two, early Mormonism had a rich understanding of the generativity of material entities that's at odds with common secular understandings of materiality as passive and inert. From scholars like John Durham Peters, Rosalind Welsh, and many others, I learned over the course of this project, um, and many of you in this room no doubt know this literature better than I do, that unlike many Protestants, Mormon theology rejects a platonic separation between matter and spirit. It exalts the quotidian material world as a source of divinity. I think that Ben Park and Jordan Watkins draw this out really nicely in their work on early Mormon materiality. Um, one of their sources that they look at is this fascinating excursus on materiality by Parley Pratt in The Prophet in 1845. Um, and it's essentially a newspaper column um, called Materiality, um, where it just goes, you know, God the Father is material. Sorry, I'll stay towards this here. Um, Jesus Christ is material, angels are material, spirits are material, men are material, the universe is material. Space is full of materiality. Um, and it goes on um, to articulate a stunningly positive view of materiality. Materiality here is agentive, it is generative, it is vital. It's the sort of thing that has the power to surprise someone and to change their course. Such emic Mormon theorizing about mater materiality is seen, I think, with especially provocative relevance to my project in one 
Um, really interested in LDS response to the Book of Abraham, which was that sheaf of Egyptian papyri found and translated by Smith in 1835. So when the extent papyri were recently found to postdate the time of Abraham's life by thousands of years, Mormon apologists developed um, what's called the catalyst theory. Um, and this intrigues me very, very much. Um, I just got this from the, the LDS official website um, where it describes the, the theory this way. According to this view, Joseph's translation was not a literal rendering of the papyri as a conventional translation would be. Rather, the physical artifacts provided an occasion for meditation, reflection, and revelation. They catalyzed a process whereby God gave to Joseph Smith a revelation about the life of Abraham, even if that revelation did not directly correlate to the characters on the papyri. This idea of the material papyri as providing an occasion and as catalyzing a, a translation process is exactly what I had in mind when I argued that the material printing plates furnished circumstances that enabled the development of Smith's scriptural imagination and his writing of the Book of Mormon. They provided a prompt for his religious imagination, catalyzing a process that culminated in his creation of scripture. So maybe I really am a Mormon apologist because I am very compelled by this. This apologetic position, I would say, is a fascinating theory about how reality works. It posits that religious inspiration can come from encounters with the material world, and that that ontology is characterized by ongoing traffic between human and non-human forces. So again, I wanna ask, what if scholars were to approach Mormon ideas, even you know, as distilled in this apologetic LDS website, as theory and not just as data? What if I were to not hold this catalyst theory away from me as something that makes sense only in another world, but I let it unsettle me? Then I might start to let this theory change my own ways of viewing things, leading me to ask, for instance, well, what else is a catalyst? Um, what other material things have powers in the world? So this is my final slide, and I'm just gonna talk over it till the end. Questions about materiality and its powers um, particularly interests me because I'm a scholar of material culture. But I think they may only be the beginning of what questions could be asked if scholars did not de facto assume the radical alterity of religion. What else can we learn from Mormonism? Or for that matter, from Afro-Atlantic religions, or from Zoroastrianism, or from Chinese Buddhism, and so on. What do religions have to say about the nature of time? About what the subject is? About how consciousness works the way it does? About how historical change occurs? Um, those are just a few things off the top of my head. Finally, while most of my reflections have been directed at religious studies, I also want to address Mormon studies, which I think is generally, if I may, too modest about its contributions to ways of scholarly thinking outside of its fiefdom. While Mormon studies has itself been quite interdisciplinary and game for calling in all sorts of ideas from the larger academy, uh, for example, thank you so much for inviting me to your conference. Um, there are missed opportunities for the opposite movement. What forms of theory and ways of knowing can Mormon studies offer the larger academy? What does Mormon studies have to offer other fields in how scholarship is even approached and is done? So I know that Mormon studies loves its data. I love, I love data too. But the Mormon tradition is also steeped in a distinctive epistemological way of approaching all sorts of data. This, um, this epistemological way of, of seeing things is an intellectual resource that scholars of, um, all sorts of all sorts of disciplines, all kinds, could stand to learn from and not only about. So thank you.